Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Buffalo Bills Center of the West. You can see that I'm talking to you on a new microphone. Very exciting. I can stay a whole foot away from it and be heard. My name is Eric Rossborough. I'm Associate Librarian and Senior Cataloger here at the McCracken Research Library. Before we get started, a little housekeeping. The next talk will be on June 8th. The Bob Richard Local Lore programs are customarily on the um, third Thursday of the month, the one in June. We're doing bi-monthly now. We'll be on the second Thursday, June 8th. It will be the history of ranching and on Rattlesnake Creek. On August, we'll be back to our regular day of the third Thursday. In August, you can come and learn about Buffalo Bill Dam, Shoshone Canyon, and Hayden Arch. With that, I'd like to be very excited about today's program. We've got a supremely talented person we're going to be focusing on today. And not only that, I'm proud to say I am a personal friend of his, sculptor Jeff Rudolph. And of course, we also have Bob Richard, host of the Local Lore Program, and a special guest, the Scarlet Curator of the West Whitney Museum of Western Art, Susan Barnett. Take it away, guys. Thank you, Eric. Can you hear me in the back? Uh, we're going to get this corrected. That's how we're going to correct it. <laughs> Is that better? Wow. That's a lot better. All right. Uh, we had a little change this morning. Mac Frost came down with a very serious cold, and he came in and helped us get set up. And so Eric's going to fill in today uh, in Mac's role. And thank you all for coming. It's good to see you. And we'll get started. And uh, I have to tell you that uh, we went through Jeff's uh, photography and, and his talk last week and came to the conclusion that the other artists that we thought we would just touch on, we're going to save for another time. So this is going to be Jeff's uh, history of his growing up and telling you his way of doing things, and uh, we found it to be very interesting. Yes. We have Eric, just like... Uh, Mac checking on us and making sure everything's right. Uh, no guarantees. Okay. Next. Next. Uh, Jeff is not, not so fast. Next. Okay. Well, maybe this is where I need to chime in. Um, First of all, I might want to just say how uh, grateful I am to Bob and uh, to the people here at the museum. This is a, uh, an awesome facility, uh, and I'm grateful to be here today. So uh, I've been sculpting since 1981, uh, and so we may as well just go ahead and get started. This is, um, my dad used to bring me odd-shaped pieces of wood, and. Uh, he was a cabinet maker, and so every once in a while he'd bring me an odd-shaped piece and say, carve me something, and this is a rabbit that I carved early on. You can see the bark on the tip of the ears. Uh, let's go ahead. And, uh, there I am teaching a class that was at Northwest College. Uh, over the years, I've taught quite a few different courses and classes. I even had hair then. Uh, this is a, an early stone that I actually carved in college. And uh, the interesting thing about that particular piece is that uh, it was about uh, two and a half times that, uh, the, the original size of this. And as I was carving it, uh, uh, it cracked and fell on the floor, just missed my big toe by about an eighth of an inch. Uh, so, but that's uh, called Quest for Heart. Next. This is a piece uh, called Fossilization. Um, 
next. And that's the other side of the same piece. Uh, kind of a shell-like piece. Next. Uh, you know, I got out of college doing non-subjective, non-objective abstract sculpture. So I was kind of a modern art fanatic at the time. And uh, uh, I thought I'd come home to Cody and turn this little town kind of on its ear, uh, doing, doing my modern art. And uh, so after a few shows, I realized that modern art wasn't really going to help me earn a living. And uh, so this is the first of a series of raptors that I did in stone. Uh, and uh, you can kind of see it's a, a little bit abstracted. But here I am starting to go realistic. So. My, my next door neighbor was, was a rodeo guy and he had a little boy uh, that was four years younger than me and they would take us out riding up the South Fork uh, just about every week we'd go up and ride and this little boy uh, didn't know how to ride a horse except at a full gallop and uh, he he accidentally killed himself when he was uh, eight years old and it left an indelible impression on me. And so uh, one of my first bronzes is a tribute to, to Bobby Scott. So next. Uh, it's really weird to see this that big. It's about three inches tall. And uh, so that's, uh, I have done numerous sculptures of Buffalo Bill and and uh, this is one of many. Next. So this is a, a, another early bronze called Beginnings. Uh, small colt. Okay, this is called the Sagebrush Twister. And this was uh, my first really uh, serious delve into bronze sculpture. Uh, I wanted to do something that would be a tribute to Remington and, and Russell. And so it's kind of loose like Russell, uh, but it's got all the attributes and all the, you know, he, he's tangled up in his McCarty and he's gonna take a header off that horse because there's a couple of rabbits that have spooked that green bronc under, under the, on the base. Um, the other thing that's kind of interesting about that, it's called the sagebrush twister because you could spin that thing. We put the uh, ball bearings right up inside the bronze, and so you could spin it on top of the wood base, which I don't think anybody had ever done before. And it would spin for quite a while. So anyway, we'll move on. This is uh, the unveiling of Y2K monument. So this was December 31st, 1999. Uh, as you all remember, our computers all went down and the world ended the next day. <laughs> so, uh, but this was, uh, I, I, I won a commission to do a piece called The Spirit of Cody and there were uh, several other people that designed models for this, and they were wonderful models. I remember one of them was a, a, a chariot with, with horses carrying Buffalo Bill into the heavens. Um, but this was my rendition, and that little girl uh, on top of his head, or, or on his shoulders, rather, is actually my daughter, Dee. So next, and there's, there's a little bit better picture of it. That's on the corner of the city park. 
Um, big boots. Yeah, uh, thank, thank you, Bob. The, the reason those boots are so big is because I wanted her to be stepping into to his shoes. And she's, uh, she and he both are looking up at that hat, and the hat is symbolic of the sun. So it's all based on a, a bright future. And the base is, is based on uh, earlier times. Uh, it's a Roman uh, capital and uh, a column capital. And so I wanted that to represent ancient times. And, uh, but anyway. Speaking of big boots, this was your first major uh, public sculpture, your first monumental scale. What was that like working at this scale? I had a blast. I really, really, truly enjoyed it. I had just, at that point, I had just built my studio and I didn't even have it finished. It was cold the whole time we did this inside there. And, uh, but it was, what a, what a great experience. I, I, I think it, uh, it changed my life doing this. Um, and I had, uh, oh, I can't think of the curator's name of the Buffalo Bill that, uh, at the time now, but Dick Frost, no, no, it was after Dick, uh, Paul Fees, Paul Fees came to the studio and he, he actually gave me a critique on Buffalo Bill's face. And we looked at zillions of photographs of Buffalo Bill and we wanted to get his face just right. And Paul Fees approved. So Okay, this, um, this is the first year that I was in the Buffalo Bill Art Show. And uh, this is called Home on the Range. And uh, this was a big deal for me. I won best of show with this piece. Uh, the piece, as I was working on it, about six weeks before the show, the stone broke and I had to start over. And so this was the fastest I've ever carved a stone uh, before or since. Uh, so anyway, uh, I'm, I'm real pleased with that. And the, the base actually has a trap door behind those two uh, caryatids that are standing with their Winchesters. Uh, you can open a, slide that door open and put your jewelry inside there or whatever you want. But anyway, um, that's home on the range. Good. This is the first bronze that I did off of a stone. And so this has, is, a, is a bronze sculpture. But it was, um, first of all, it was carved in stone. And... I tried to do a stone patina on it. I tried to make it look, that's my representation of jade, I guess. But uh, the original stone uh, was actually lost. Uh, UPS dropped it down a, a chute and uh, it, it blew through, we had it in two crates and it blew through both crates and broke one corner of the stone off. Uh, so, UPS owns that piece now. <laughs> Next. Okay, this is, this is an eagle that hangs in my studio. Uh, the sister to this particular piece is in a bank in Cincinnati. Um, I don't know... I've got a story associated with this. I don't know if I should... I modeled this piece uh, on a two inch piece of pipe. And as I modeled it, these wings are, well, you can't tell, I guess, but the wingspan of this is a, a little over nine feet. So it's a big eagle. And 
And as I was modeling it, it would kind of, you know, sway a little bit at times. And that didn't bother me in the least because I knew the pipe would hold it and I wasn't worried. But when I went to make the mold, I couldn't get the rubber to stick to the clay on the bottom side of the wings. It, it just kept sloughing off. And I, I had the mold all done on the top side and I thought, gee, what am I gonna do? And, uh, and so what I ended up doing was I, I went ahead and I made fiberglass case molds on top of the rubber on the top side of the wings and then I fiberglassed a, a, a four by four board that went from wing to wing. And then I built this humongous tower that had a basically a cradle underneath it. And I secured that tower to that four by four and I turned the whole thing upside down. And then I was able to go ahead and and uh, get the, took me a long time to figure that out. And I don't know if what I said even makes sense or is registering for you, but it was difficult. I'll just leave it at that. Did you create difficulties for the foundry as well? You know, the foundry really didn't, well, the foundry for this wasn't even a foundry because the commission was to do the piece as light as possible and they wanted it in fiberglass. And so, no, it, it was not an issue at all. And, and it wasn't an issue for the fiberglass guys either because all of these molds were separate, you know, and so they had to do everything separate and then put the pieces together. We actually had this in the 4th of July parade sitting on a pedestal. Um, uh, that next year. Okay. All right. This is one of my best pieces, I think. It's called uh, Thunder Run. And I did this piece uh, a small size and a large size. This is the large one. And uh, this is a, a buffalo that's being spooked by lightning. And uh, I did it uh, in a small size six different times before I uh, attempted to do it this size. Okay. This is a piece that I, I did at a 24 hour marathon and uh, it's called Having Her Own Way. It's a milk cow that's not cooperating. And uh, I, I went to the I took this piece to the Governor's Capital Arts Show and uh, they uh, purchased it. This was a purchase award. So it's down in the collection in Cheyenne. Next. This is a, a maquette or a model for a, a life and three quarter size monument of Ben Nighthorse Campbell that's in Golden, Colorado. And yeah, go ahead. So there I am in the studio. And uh, it's just a little over 20 feet tall. So, okay. And here's the, the fellow doing the finishing patinas. Ben Nighthorse Campbell was a U.S. Senator um, and he wanted to be portrayed in full Indian regalia on his uh, paint stallion. Um, when, we, when we got all the pieces cast, I actually had this put together in Lander and uh, we, we weighed all the pieces, and I can't remember what the whole thing weighed, but just the feathers for the trailing headdress and the feathers in the bonnet and on the coos stick weighed over a thousand pounds. Next. So there we are installing the piece. Okay. 
Oh, okay. Here I am, I'm carving uh, Annie Oakley. Uh, and this was a, a really fun carving for me. And, and actually, uh, the face isn't Annie Oakley. It's, it's uh, what we as artists call artist license, I guess. It's a, more of a classical face. Uh, it looks a lot like my mother actually <laughs> and and this go ahead and here's the finish piece so does the color of the stone influence your carving your design as you go along the color is absolutely critical um i did a i did a sculpture one year of a fellow and and it's hard to see the colors when you're carving, it's almost impossible to tell what the color is. And so you hope for the best, you pray that it's gonna be, that it's gonna work out. And as we got closer and closer on this fellow, he had a big red stripe right through his face. And we quit. <laughs> and, uh, and went back and got a different stone, so. Anyway, yeah. This is my neighbor again. This is uh, Cowboy Bob. I talked about his son earlier and I couldn't resist. I've worked in a lot of different kinds of stone and this was a particularly fun stone and I just, uh, I wanted to do something that would be memorable to him and, uh, and to me and this was kind of fun, so yeah. This is another type of stone that I worked in. This is, uh, this is a piece called Blue Roan. And uh, I don't think I even put the finished piece in here, but uh, it was sold here at the museum several years ago. And uh, uh, Blue, uh, most of you probably know, are familiar with the Blue Roan, uh, uh, a horse that typically is, goes by that title is kind of a, a, a gray color uh, in, the, in the winter. But in the, in the summer, they go black or vice versa. So anyway, that's Blue Roan and that's black steatite from uh, Vermont. This is a horse that I did uh, that was purchased at auction uh, by Mrs. Holland, and that uh, she she has a wonderful gallery in her home. Uh, and I actually built the pedestal that that sits on as well out of black walnut. Um, okay, uh, you know, I, let me talk about this one for just a second. This is... Uh, this is called Cow Puncher's Prayer. And this was actually uh, the second time I had done this pose. The first time I, w I was just out of college and uh, it was a female figure that I did in this pose and the title was The Worshipper. And I, I took a first place at the Cody Country Art League, and at the time I was very proud of that, and uh, and I won the Harry Jackson Award at the same the same year, and uh, it was in, uh, it caused all kinds of craziness in my life that that piece because uh, an opera singer who was in town who flew into Cody happened to go into the art league and she saw that piece. I had, I had a huge price on it, 750 bucks. And I thought, man, I'll never sell it because it's so expensive. And she said, Jeff, I'll buy that if you'll deliver it to Chicago. And I thought, wow, what a deal. <laughs> and I did. And I, I boxed it up and took it to Chicago. I got lost on the south side of Chicago. Um, 
And uh, a, a bunch of helpful fellows came out and surrounded my pickup and told me I was on the right road. And so I just kept going and, uh, and I eventually got, got to where I was going. She lived in a, uh, an amazing penthouse top floor of a high-rise building and took me out for dinner, a $75 plate. Uh, I'll never forget Natalie Souter. She was a mezzo-soprano uh, for the Lyric Opera Company in Chicago. Anyway. Wonderful. I used to do a Christmas piece every Christmas, and this was one of my Christmas pieces, a Santa Bell. It's about... Mm, five inches tall, a little smaller than that. Okay, this is, uh, this is my chess set. This is uh, Buffalo Bill. Next to him to the left is Annie Oakley, and next to her is uh, Sitting Bull. The other bishop is Iron Tail. And then uh, the two horses are two of Bill's favorite, Tucker and Charlie. And then the rooks, of course, were teepees from Pahaska Teepee. Charlie's the horse that died on the boat and was buried at sea uh, on the way back from Europe. And, uh, and of course, the ponds are just running buffalo, so. All right, this was the model for the, for the bears maybe you've seen around town. Uh, so this was the model. Uh, I was teaching a class at, at the Cody Country Art League to adults, and uh, a nice woman came in and she said, gee, uh, would you like to submit? We, we want to do a... a a big, a large animal, a, a, a bear, for the community to raise funds for the library. And I said, well, yeah, I, I wanna be involved. I, I'd like to be part of that. And so she said, well, have some models here for me next week and, and we'll, we'll, look at, we'll look them over. And so I had this model and two others. And uh, she came the next week to the class and she said, well, it, 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 it's all for naught, Jeff, because we've already chosen the guy who's going to do the, the piece for us. And I'm kind of a timid, shy sort of fellow, but I kind of got in her face. And I said, you know, I've worked all week on these three pieces. I've put a lot of time into them. I think the least you could do is take them and show them. And then if they're, not, they're still not interested, then I'm good with that. I, I'm fine. Uh, so she took him and uh, she came back the next week to the class and she said, you know what? We like the bear. We're gonna, we're gonna have you do the bear. So we ended up doing uh, 25 large bears and 100 small bears and uh, Frances Clymer was very pleased at the end. She said, Jeff, uh, you've raised an endowment for the library of over a million dollars. So we were pleased. Wow. So, and there's a stone. I couldn't resist carving a stone. You know, the only reason I do bronzes is so I can afford to do a stone. Uh, <laughs> I like doing stones, and uh, actually this stone uh, did pretty well for me. We, we sold it at the Buffalo Bill Art Show. Uh, it, it took a first place, and it, it sold for uh, two and a half times what I had uh, marked it for. So uh, we were very pleased. I hear you might be sharing a stone next, this year. Yes, I am. I am. Uh, I'm excited too. I've been working really hard on it, so hopefully it'll work out. I'm doing a buffalo skull with a with a rabbit looking between his horns. So, anyway. Okay, uh, what I left out on that great story about the uh, the bear stone 
is that when it got shipped, it was lost in shipping. And it went to a John Deere dealership and, and uh, they opened up the crate and the guy that, that opens the crates there said, well, I, I emptied out the crate the way I always empty out the crate. I take the lid off, I get back in the forklift and I just flip the crate over. And unfortunately, that bear broke a, a, his ear off. And the guy who had paid well over $20,000 for that sculpture was very disappointed. And uh, I told him that I would carve him another bear just like it. But the only proviso I had was it had to be a mirror image. So his bear was looking this this direction, and I carved him a bear looking the opposite way so that it didn't bore me to death when I carved it. I, otherwise, he wouldn't have got as good a piece. So, and the next picture is, uh, it's kind of out of focus, but that's the bear that I was carving for him. So, uh, Jeff? Where's the uh, bear with the broken ear? Oh, yeah. Well, when that happened, uh, the company that shipped it said, uh, you know, you can buy this back for salvage, which I wanted to do. But they said, uh, we have to come and cut it up. If, if we, because we don't want you to, to uh, use it for anything. You can't use it for anything. And I said, well, you, you bring it down here to Cody, uh, take it into the Chamber of Commerce, I told him, to the Art League, and I'll bring my saw. I had a, a, a chainsaw with diamond impregnated chain that would cut stone. And I told him, I'll cut it up and we'll make sure that it hits all the papers and uh, that you guys broke my stone and now I can't use it for anything. And I, I promised him that I wouldn't sell it. And so now it's at the Park County Library on display. And so I think that's a neat story. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So these are some of the bears that were in that uh, library fundraiser. Yeah, that library fundraiser, uh, and they did a they did a nice book, and uh, I only painted one of them. Uh, mine's in the bottom row on the third from the left. I tried to make it look like stone. <laughs> okay. All right. Now, this is a, a piece. It's a cutting horse piece. And uh, I got this commission to do this. And I, I didn't know anything about cutting horses. Uh, but I knew somebody who did. Uh, a fellow that I went to school with, Bob Curtis, whose folks... Uh, kind of ran the two dot for years and years. Uh, he, Bob, that is to say, Bob was a, a great cutting horse guy. And uh, he was a ranch manager at the J-Bar 9 on the South Fork. And I called him up. I said, can I come up and watch you cut horses or cut calves? And he said, no, you can't. I don't let anybody come up here. Uh, and I, I was flabbergasted. I said, Bob, you know me. I, I'm not going to burn the place down. I've changed a lot. <laughs> and uh, he said, no, uh, you can't come up. And I, I told him, I said, I, I got this commission. And if I don't learn how to do this right, I'm going to look pretty stupid. He said, OK, come on. So I went up. And he let me go. He cut uh, these calves. Uh, he cut these calves outside. He didn't want me. 
uh, on in the indoor arena, uh, you know. Uh, so uh, I took pictures out there, and it was really interesting because he wasn't cutting normal cattle. He was doing buffalo yearlings. And I told him, I said, Bob, why, why are you doing buffalo yearlings? He said, well, they, first of all, they intimidate the horse. They're, they're faster, they're bigger, they're more agile, they're harder to cut. Every, every reason that he gave just made perfect sense. And so he and Steve Devnans was up there hazing for him. And it was, it was a, just a great experience. I, I would see Bob's uh, stirrup on the, on the one side of the horse clear down in the sand. That horse was leaning over that far. So it was, it was a great experience. Bob, Bob's an amazing guy. I, uh, I love him. He's a terrific fellow. Okay. This is a stone piece. This is Colorado alabaster. This was called, uh, um, he's a wild one. Okay. Okay, this is uh, uh, Marianne Andrus and her husband, Gordon. And, uh, Marianne was the curator of education here at the museum, but she and Gordon worked at several museums and they had authentic costumes and they came and modeled for me at my studio. And the original uh, base for this particular piece was a music box and uh, you'd flip a switch and it would turn and play anniversary waltz. Uh, but what I really wanted was something that you could kind of hand crank and turn and play at the same time. And I never really figured out how to do that. And, um, and by the time I had replaced the, the motors for three of these twice, I decided not to do any more music boxes. I, I thought that was a big mistake. <laughs> Okay, there's a close-up. Gordon was a saddle maker here. They've since moved away, but uh, they own one of these. I gave them one for modeling for me. They're great people. Okay. This is a, a rabbit called Nestled In. This is a, a piece that I did. Uh, Jeff Schren did a, a a film of me doing this from start to finish. And they played that film here in the museum for several years. Uh, so it started with a, a charcoal sketch and uh, went clear through uh, making molds and doing welding the piece, uh, casting the piece, doing the, the patina of the piece. Uh, it was a lot of fun and I really enjoyed working with Jeff and and they showed all the tools and everything here in the museum for several years. It was fun. Do you always start with drawings, Jeff? Sorry? Do you always start with drawings in your process, or do you sometimes just pick up a lump of clay? and? I almost always start with a, a drawing, and, and it's harder now that I'm a little older because I have a tremor. So now my drawings are sort of scribble drawings, but but I still I still like to scribble it out and and uh, and then yeah uh, model it up. You bet. Drawing is integral to the whole process. I think drawing is absolutely critical to the whole process. This is a piece called Unstrung, and. Uh, What's, what's fun about this piece, my kids loved this piece because they could, they could push on the bronze and it would do this. And uh, so they finally got the idea they could pull on that one hoof and it might hit their sister if they pulled it far enough. But anyway, this is called Unstrung. It took me two years to figure out how to, how to mount the bronze on a, a, a spiraled rope like that. I tried to use, 
uh, we, we, we cast a rope out of bronze and it broke. And we fabricated a rope out of stainless steel. And it was almost, well, I had Chuck from Chuck's Welding uh, spiral those four rods into that stainless steel deal. And uh, he said, you nearly broke my lathe. I'm never doing another one of those ever again. And so we ended up uh, making them out of cold rolled steel and spiraled them. And the problem with that is bronze and steel, stainless steel is fine. Bronze and stainless steel get along perfectly. Um, but bronze and regular steel fight each other. And many of you probably remember seeing the Statue of Liberty, which is a copper statue uh, when they had scaffold all over it, uh, that was because it had uh, a disease where it was attached to the steel and they had to fix all those points and put stainless steel in there and then braze the copper to the stainless steel. Okay. This was a piece that I did at a 24 hour marathon called Bill Collector. So it's a pelican going underwater and gr trying to grab a fish. What does that mean when it's a 24 hour marathon? You come in with a lump of clay or a drawing or what, what's the process? They would allow us to come in with an armature, a bare armature and uh, there were uh, and the and, and there were painters there as well, and they they were able to come in with with a drawing, and go ahead and paint. Uh, um, we all had to use the very same clay. We couldn't bring our own clay. We had to to use uh, if we had we're going to look at something. We had to look at our own. Um, uh, materials. We couldn't uh, uh, look at somebody else's artwork or anything like that. So, yeah. I, I got a kick out of this piece. And there, so at the end of 10, 24 hours, you had something that was ready to cast. That's correct. That's impressive. Yeah. I liked it so much, I actually carved it out of uh, Russian olive. You know, that's that weed that uh, we cut down all over. Uh, so this is Russian olive. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. is, is that a very hard wood? Is it hard to carve? It, it is difficult. It's, uh, it reminds me of elm or uh, oak. It's not quite as hard as elm, though. Uh, but it's very toxic. It's, uh, I had to wear a respirator the whole, the whole time. I couldn't be around it at all. It seems like a time to just talk about materials a little bit. And um, I think you, you work in so many different media. And um, when you have an idea, does that influence what kind of ma material you use to make the sculpture, whether you go with wood or stone or bronze? How does your mind work that way? That's a, that's a great question, Susan. Um, you know, if, if you're using the wrong material, you're you're preparing yourself for a failure. And so you have to, I, I always try to think, well, how can I make this work? Uh, I mean, I would really like to do some dynamic thing in stone where the guy is reaching for the sun, but his arm's gonna break off. Uh, it's not gonna happen. So you have to be, really aware of, of the tensile strength of the material that you're working with. Uh, also, it's important to get the, the center of gravity so that when it's standing up, it's not gonna wanna fall over. Uh, there, there's a lot to it. Um, the other thing that, that uh, maybe you might find of interest is being a sculptor you need to know a lot of different things. Uh, math became a lot more important to me uh, than it was when I was in school. Uh, welding was a skill I didn't have that I had to acquire. I actually worked for three different sculptors welding bronzes for them. Uh, 
doing patinas. I did all my own patinas for many, many years. Uh, uh, I, I ground and chased bronze with, they, they call it chasing bronze, where you take a, a high-speed air grinder, 100,000 RPM grinder, and you grinding welds out and putting the details back into the sculpture. Um, so yeah, I worked f I worked for several different foundries uh, over the years, and uh, uh, anyway, yeah. Okay, this is a piece called the Fish Whisperer. I I enjoyed that bill collector so much. I wanted to do another pelican, and uh, I had uh, seen a, a. I actually I think I had read something about how pelicans get in a semicircle and they herd fish into the shallows and then they feed on them and I thought, well, wouldn't it be fun to call this the fish whisperer? So that, that originally was a stone and this is, uh, both of these pictures are bronzes with stone patinas. Okay, this is, uh, this is the bugle box and this piece stands five inches tall and uh, this is a, a, a quick draw from the Buffalo Bill Art Show. In fact, uh, the next several pieces are, are quick draws uh, from the art show. Um, but this is a, a small bronze that sits on a, a little wooden bowl that I made. And it, the bowl has grooves cut into it. And under the bronze, there's two little knobs that fit in the groove, and then you just turn it, and it hooks into the bowl. So, next. Okay, this is called Jack-O-Lantern. This is another quick draw. Jack-O-Lantern. Next. This is uh, another Buffalo Bill, and this is a bell. So, of course, this is Buffalo Bell, yeah, and I, I, I have a weird sense of humor, I know, so anyway, next. Uh, this is a piece called Scootin, and uh, I messed around with Scootin for a long time. Uh, I always practice my quick draw pieces. Uh, I'll do six or seven practices at least usually at least that many. And this particular piece uh, was an armature that, that had ball joints. And uh, it was fully articulated. In other words, I could pose the armature any way I wanted. And uh, I, used, uh, I used the skeleton of a cottontail uh, to figure out how to make the armature. I measured all the import, all the larger bones, and every joint had a ball joint that I fabricated myself. It took me quite a while to make it. Okay, next. Okay, this is uh, this is called love letters, and this is uh, again a quick draw from Buffalo Bill Art Show. We had an, uh, an hour and. We just had an hour for this one, yeah. And this is the hardest quick draw I ever did. We, th this was the year they upped it to an hour and a half and I thought, wow, I wanna try something hard. And wow, it was hard. Uh, so this is called Brothers. It's a couple of moose, uh, you know, having their sibling war here, so. Uh, and it was modeled in wax because I couldn't do the clay uh, fast enough. The clay, every time I touched it, it moved. So I used a, a harder material. I used wax. Okay. Ah, this is called the bear box. Uh, and that, again, is uh, another quick draw. Okay. Okay. This is uh, uh, not a quick draw. This is, uh, uh, I, early in my career, I, I couldn't do enough eagles. I wanted to do eagles and I, I had done one other eagle in bronze 
called fly fishing many, many years ago. Uh, it was an eagle diving down and grabbing a trout. And I wasn't satisfied. I had to do one more. This is called a wing and a prayer. And he's after a little cottontail down there. I actually saw an eagle pick up a cottontail. Uh, and so kind of dedicated to that experience, I guess. Okay, this is called Heroes. And uh, I, I, should have, I should have put in a, a, another picture where you could see the horse is actually on two legs and the rider has his, his uh, right leg thrown over the back of the horse, but he hasn't completely got on yet. Um, this is uh, dedicated to these guys like Roy Rogers and uh, Gene and, you know, all the rest. That, uh, that All those guys could get on a horse while it was running. And I thought, well, I, I want to do one where the horse is spooked a little bit. So I made him rear up a little bit as the cowboy's jumping on. Uh, okay, this is... Uh, you can't tell that that's bronze, can you? But that, that's, uh, that's bronze that's been sandblasted. And so the bike has actually uh, been uh, patinaed, I believe. The bike is made out of stainless steel and the rider is bronze. Uh, do we have another one of that? No, I guess we don't. Okay, uh, I should tell you, can we go back? That's Levi Leipheimer from Butte, Montana. He was biker of the year in 2012. And uh, I got a commission. They, uh, I got a phone call from Golden, Colorado, and they said, uh, would you put in for our bike rider? We want a bronze bike uh, with a, a road racer. And I said, well, sure, I'll put in for it. But I said, uh, you don't want a bronze bike because somebody will push on that bike until it breaks off. You need a stainless steel bike. And uh, I said, uh, you guys have quite a few bronzes. I'll bet, I'll bet some of your bronzes have been uh, mutilated by vandals because if there's a small area where they can break something off, sometimes they do. And they said, sure enough, we, we have. So uh, about two days after they called me, they called me back and said, gee, uh, we want you to just do it. That, that stainless steel idea was a really good idea, so. Okay, this is called ponytails. I did a large version and a small version. This is the large version. And on the back side of this, on the wood base, there's a slot for a book. So anyway, ponytails. And this is called mosquitoes. And again, you know, that strange sense of humor. So this is called Cliffhanger. This is a, a piece that uh, I really enjoyed doing. It was, uh, uh, frankly, I was just gonna make a bookend and it was gonna be that bighorn sheep. And I got back uh, looking at it after I had set it aside for a month or two and I thought, you know, I had to really just put a predator on the other side. And so we called it Cliffhanger. Here I am at one of the numerous art shows uh, I attended over the years. And, and you don't see a stone there because uh, stones are, uh, they're, they're hard to afford. So you have to sell all those bronzes and then you get to do a stone. And, uh, and that was my disease. I love doing stones. Okay. All right, so this is the World War II uh, monument that's here just, uh, just south of Cody at the War Memorial Park. Uh, and 
uh, those are real dog tags. Uh, I had a good friend by the name of Chuck Iker who served in Korea and I begged him to let me cast his dog tags. Uh, he was my boss for many years between, uh, uh, during the summer between college and I really liked Chuck. Um, so that's, there's two of those out there. And um, the other dog tags are somebody from the foundry had a, a grandfather and they wanted his dog tags. And so that one says Hamilton. So this is a wood carving that I did for the, the, the Cody Bronk class of 1964. And uh, they commissioned me to do this wood carving and uh, they have since started a, an endowment fund for the uh, high school and they're trying to raise um, oh two or three million dollars for that endowment. Uh, they've, I know that they're, they're asking different uh, classes, different years to contribute and have an ongoing thing. Uh, we only have one art teacher in the whole of the high school. Uh, and, um, you know, several years ago there was three, but now there's only one. And there was only one when I was a kid, so I'd, I'd kind of like to see another one get put in. But anyway, uh, that's my beautiful daughter standing behind an ice carving right out in front of this place. I used to do uh, ice carvings every winter. It was fun. Uh, usually it was at Bell Plaza, but this one was in front of the museum. That's a bear and two cups. Okay, there's another alabaster piece. Uh, this is called Renegade, and I made a mold off of off of it, and here's the bronze of the same piece. Next. Next. And there it is. Okay, and... Your stone patinos get more and more sophisticated as the years go on. Yeah, they, they got a little better, didn't they? Yeah. I'm... I'm it, it was fun. Uh, uh, there's a company in town that does my metal plates for me, and this is uh, 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 Art, Art Sand and Steel is the name of that company, and they are phenomenal people. They're just great people, and they do a great job. So, okay, this is a ceramic piece that was fired in the kiln. Uh, this is, uh, gosh, I can't, I can't remember what I called this piece. Um, it might have been horse hugs, I'm not sure. But the girl's hair actually comes around and forms the mane of the horse on the other side. And between the strands of hair on the mane, it's cut out so that you can look into the hollow of the ceramic vessel and it was designed as a night light. And so we put a light in there and it, it creates kind of a neat little night light. Okay. And this is the second Buffalo Bill chess set. Uh, the first one was a little dangerous because if you played somebody that had a, a, a bad temper, he, he could probably kill you with the with one of those pieces. They were big and heavy. They uh, some of them were as much as six inches tall, and these are considerably smaller. So, okay, this is another uh, uh, stone piece that actually this is bronze with a stone patina. I think maybe this is maybe my most successful patina. Uh, this is catamount. And uh, this, the original stone uh, is on a ranch uh, close, to, close to town here. Uh, this is a, another bear, yet another bear in that same pose. Uh, 
but he's guarding a salmon at this point. And again, that's a stone patina. And here's, uh, here's the, the buffalo that I did. Uh, this was uh, the stone version of the, of the buffalo. Um, and we did, I'm sure you've all seen those big buffalo around town. So the next one is me carving, I think, yeah, carving the stone version. And the, the big plaster version is right behind it. So there it is. Okay, here's a, a paper casting of the lower falls of Yellowstone. And uh, you can see this piece over at West Park Hospital by the radiology lab. It's a good size piece. And this is one of the last bronzes that I've done. It's, this is a piece called um, Horsefly. So he's biting at his haunch there. And I had to do another cliffhanger uh, because I wanted to carve it in stone. And so this is a bronze, but it's uh, stone patina. And I wanted to do the bighorn sheep instead of a goat, but it didn't fit the rock. So I ended up doing a goat with a mountain lion. Okay. And then uh, this is a, a new thing that I've been trying to perfect. I've been working on some relief uh, sculptures and so this is kind of a nostalgic thing for me, growing up, born and raised right here in Cody. Next. And there's a uh, statue of Bob Richard. Uh, so That's a Yellowstone horse ranger. Don't let him kid you. <laughs> so anyway, I think we're near the end. Yeah, that uh, took Jeff a couple of years to work on, looking and deciding just how to make it look. And one of my sons said, wow, it, the horse looks like Big Red, but I'm not sure about you, Dad. Here's a tree that I've been working on here at the museum. This is a, a, a mount for a... a um, a grizzly bear skeleton. And that's a, a skeleton of a mountain lion on the left there. Next. Okay. Do we have one more or is that it? That's it. Uh, Jeff, thank you very much for sharing with us a very special insight uh, for you as a sculptor uh, and a teacher, and uh, I always learn, and today was very special to me, and thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions? If not, uh, thank you for coming today, and uh, we'll look forward to your next, uh, our next talk. Oh, I'll be signing books upstairs in a few minutes. Everyone come upstairs and get a signed personal copy of one of Bob's works. We'll see you up there. Thanks for coming. And thanks to Jeff and Susan.